Cheers, Stuart. Um, I'm a typical Brummie, so if you can't understand me, I apologise. Um, some of you may have saw me at the reception desk. I've been fired from that job, so they said, do you want to slot in as a, as a speaker? Um, so uh, I'll ta- I'm basically going to take you on a bit of a journey as to kind of what I've been through, um, having worked for Virgin as a group, but more prominently Virgin Trains. Bit of Yopa Property Limited, um, they're a hybrid estate, estate agent. Um, and then some of the cool stuff that we've recently done with Green King as well. Um, so yeah, so um, I think the good thing about me slotting in and kind of being here is that I've got to see what Donna, Julie and Jared have gone through this morning. And if I'm honest, there's a lot of lift and shift into what I'm going to talk about as well. So very complimentary of you guys for very good presentations. Um, my slides aren't as glamorous, unfortunately. So there's a lot of me talking, so I apologise about that. So, um, so who am I? Um, not sure who that guy is. Uh, that was me training for the marathon uh, some, feels like forever ago. That was a couple of years ago now, maybe four or five, in fact. Uh, just I look a bit skinny on there, so I thought I'd put that out there. Um, but I've got 16 years' experience in contact centres. Um, along that journey, I've implemented a lot of live chat channels as well. Um, more uh, prominently, social media. So I've got 10 years' experience, or just over, um, as said, having worked with Virgin and the like. Um, along that journey is obviously a lot of customer journey planning um, and customer experience work that I've been able to get my hands in. So, um, so for Virgin Trains, um, their social journey started 10 years ago, August 2009. Um, a bit like some of you out there and, and speakers we've already gone through, um, we started that journey where we, we encouraged customers to engage with us on social. However, we asked them to email us so not a great start to a social journey and a bit, you know, not very fluid at all in terms of a customer journey. Um, but that's what we thought was the right thing to do. We didn't really understand social media. Um, and so through a lot of trial and error, um, looking at the way the teams work, social media teams, specialists, generalists who could do a bit of everything, um, we grew such a prominent um, social, social uh, presence that you know, there was no real one-size-fits-all. So I'm not going to sit here and preach and say everything worked. I think you need to try and understand what works for your business. But there is a lot of trial and error, and a lot of errors will happen on that, that journey. Um, but I think one of the key things for us that we, keep, we kept missing a trick of was who are our customers and what is it that they actually want. So um, we held a lot of focus groups with our customers, um, we looked at the industry, we looked at customers that were actually engaging with us, and the biggest thing that came out of it for us was that we were never there when our customers really wanted us. So we thought we was a nine to five traditional you know, social media team. We thought we would you know, extend a few hours here and there, especially weekends, but actually, as a railway, we're a 24 seven business, and a lot of the um, communication we get from our customers were you know, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at midnight when we're not there. So why are we active in a nine to five platform when we've got other channels available for our customers, but when they really need us the most, or from a crisis management perspective, when you can guarantee as soon as you close your call center or social media team, that's when crisis kicks off. Um, we just wasn't there. So we were the first train operator to go 24 seven within that industry. Um, I'm really proud that that was based on our own resource. It wasn't um, looking at outsourcing, there's nothing against outsourcing, but you know we wanted to pride ourselves on being there for our customers and it's our people that live and breathe the brand, live and breathe the tone of voice that um, are there for our customers. Um, during that journey then at Virgin Trains, we went through a lot of uh, trial, and, trial and error again in terms of what department is best fit for social media. And again, I'm gonna lean on my experiences here as to what worked for us, it's not necessarily gonna work for you, however, we, try, we grew out of customer relations, we moved into marketing, we moved into corporate affairs, we became more of a communications channel, integrated more with internal comms, and actually, we're, without saying too customer focused, we're integral to everybody's journey across that internal and external um, you know, uh, journey. So in terms of the, what department does it fit in, for, from us as a train company, we sat in control, who were the hub of the network. We were still a communication channel for customers, a two-way communication channel, but um, we leaned on our marketing experience for content. However, we sat under corporate affairs because we started to understand more of the 
political aspect of the railway, so privatisation, non-privatisation, um, started to understand more from a PR perspective, a news, a media, and as the, the girl said earlier in terms of um, you can guarantee you know, crisis is going to kick off on social media. So we're be best place to be then. We're in the hub of the network. We understand our marketing channels. However, if it was to kick off, and for those that probably travelled in by train and flooding today, you know full well that crisis can kick off at any point. Um, that's just, again, what worked for us as a train company. Um, again, a bit about that journey then is that um, I'm a huge believer of getting the right people in the right jobs. And for us, we were fortunate enough, we had people that live and breathe Virgin as a, as a brand day in, day out. However, what they didn't really believe in was social media. So along that kind of, you know, the last 10 years or so, it's getting people out of the traditional channels, such as white mail, fax machines do still exist in some of the businesses I've worked for, uh, and, and you guys maybe, I don't know. Um, there's live chat, but in terms of social media, I think there was always that perception of, hang on a minute, I'm not just having a telephone call, I'm not speaking one-on-one -on -one via live chat, I'm out to the masses. And that's quite a scary thing at times. So I think um, there's room for generalists, there's room for um, multi-skilled people. But I think you know what worked for us as a train company, we wanted people not only to live and breathe the brand, but also live and breathe social media as well. So I'm hoping that everyone this morning has seen the new John Lewis ad. So you know, for me, in terms of the teams that I've built in the past, to get them super excited and energised about social, it's understanding current affairs, what's happening in the moment, how can we be part of that conversation? What do I think of Edgar? For those that have seen it, I'm not convinced yet. I'm more about the penguin from yonder year. But I think for me, um, it's, again, getting those people that re are really enthused with social. And it just so happens that Virgin are quite, I keep using this word, banterful. It's not, I don't think it's a word, but it should be added to the dictionary. <laughs> I think for me, that's where, you know, people who understand banter, understand tone of voice, understand tongue-in-cheek humour. But actually, on the flip of that, okay, when, uh, when, when, when crisis comes, hits, and, you know, you have to act on the fly, it's kind of that... Um, how do you also adapt yourself and your tone of voice to that as well and be, be purposeful in those moments? Um, and along that journey, probably is a plug for all, and you'll find out why a bit later on, but um, you know, we, we trolled every single platform you could ever imagine. So those that are going on that journey at the moment to understand what is the best platform and why, I'll always say you, know, you need to find out what's right for your business. Um, you need to understand kind of what it is you want from a strategy perspective, your own objectives, and then how, how certain platforms can help leverage that within, within your business, meeting the committed obligations or your own commercial value. So yeah, we, we did use Orlo, or social sign as it was known back then. Um, so we've built this team, we've got fantastic banterful humour going on, uh, we've got really energetic people, enthused, we're 24-7, um, and we're a virgin brand. So it's kind of how do we keep that going? How do we entice customers to keep coming back to our channels um, and with real purpose? So for those that can or can't see a lot of this, um, the top left-hand corner is uh, something I'm going to lean on. So you may have heard of something called Poogate. Uh, so it was a story that panned out on Twitter. Um, completely out the blue. So this was basically a, a young, um, young guy in his hour of need went to the toilet and uh, he needed some toilet roll because we'd run out. And so he tweeted the team and being in control, we were able to then reach out to the train manager <laughs> and go and get him some toilet roll. So for us, what was, or it was a bit unusual, but for something for us was just doing our job and being there from a customer perspective. Um, was great. However, unbeknown to us, he's quite an influential young blogger. Um, he's an influencer. We genuinely didn't know this. And it started to get a bit of traction from celebrities. And before we knew it, 600 million pieces of unique content worldwide. And I'm talking Korea, spoof videos from China, um, Australia, as far as you can possibly think. We had a lot of communication during that uh, time. So I don't know what the estimated media value would have been, but for us that was just an example of being in the right moment, doing what we knew was what, what we do every day in theory. Um, however, what no one really picked up was the fact that we had no toilet roll in the toilet. And I was like, <laughs> for, so, so for me being a customer service agent, I'm going, you know, why haven't, you know, we should have replenished that or, or known about it. But I think it just shows the power of organic content 
um, and just being in that moment for the right reasons. Um, other examples, I know we used on, we leaned on the kind of human emotive um, behaviours of our customers and, and brands earlier, um, but it, again, it's kind of known what, what makes our customers tick. Um, so this one was just a young boy, um, crisis had hit, we had no trains down to London, he was an Everton fan, going down to his you know, football team in London, and um, the coaches had broke down, and there was, I, I can't, I'm going to use flooding, I don't think it was, but we used flooding, couldn't get anywhere, and we just came to the, you know, came to his rescue, basically, and got him down to London, um, along with a few other Everton fans that were stranded. But again, that was just us doing our job and trying to be, you know, show that human side of our brand. But again, that got a huge pickup from the football community. Um, all of a sudden, we started to grow our football fan base, which was great, which meant that we could have banter with footballers then. So the bottom left hand one is, hi, Chris Smalling. It's a context. Chris Smalling was a Manchester United uh, player. It was a local derby. They're playing Manchester City. And um, he'd just scored an own goal. Um, and so um, I can't remember if he got sent off or whether it was just an own goal, but it was high Chris Smalling looking for a one-way ticket out of Manchester, question mark. Um, we've got tickets to London Euston from £12.50, one way, of course. So trying to kind of get him as quickly as popular out of Manchester, but again, get our price point in there. So very tongue-in-cheek. Again, great, great uh, opportunity to jump on, you know, potentially a trending topic, just being in the moment, really. Um, and the rest of the... The, the content there, I said, is just um, understanding what makes our customers tick um, and just building our content uh, around our customers, essentially. Um, so we've built up our team. We've got our 24-7. We're there, what I believe, for our customers. Through our content, we start to build up our advocacy, and which really helps you in times of crisis. So um, at the time, we had social sign-in for our, our crisis comms, and it played a huge part in that. Um, where during normal um, standard practice, we'd probably get 1,200 pieces of um, communication from our customers per day on our social channels. During crisis, that can exceed to anything from 8,000 to 12,000 tweets, if we put that into perspective. Um, so for us, it was having a tool or a platform in, uh, which enabled us to reach out to every single one of those customers, as that was a huge KPI of ours. Um, and using the flooding, we'll keep that flooding trend going, it's raining and so on. Um, believe it or not, there's a train track somewhere underneath there, um, which you can't see. That's actually a rail down the middle, it's not a railway. Um, so in, in Carlisle, in Cumbria, um, uh, you know, the, the flooding up there was so severe that we had no trains. But what we tried to do is we, we posted pictures about the event out on our social channels to show there's a reason we've got no trains going north um, of Preston. Um, because customers just couldn't understand the logic as to, okay, just reroute them or get extra trains, which isn't possible when you've got a fleet. Um, and so for us, it was just to try and show more of that human approach to, to crisis management as best we could. Again, we've got leaves on the track and, and bushes down and things like that. So um, in a nutshell, in terms of that, you know, Virgin Trains teams that we built up, we like to think that we were agile enough that we, we covered every eventuality, whether it be crisis, whether it be our content, or whether it be just jumping on stuff because it's social. You know, social is a two way communication stream, but we always treated it as a radio show. So it was like, come and keep us company, we'll engage with you. You know, it's a two way friendly communication, like we would chat if we was out having a coffee. Um, that's what social should be about. So I'm not saying corporate brands need to be corporate or you know, need to be very um, robotic, I think probably the word on social. I think you need to think of social as a two-way engaging platform and just treat people like human beings. Um, and I, again, I know we touched on a lot of that earlier, but the, the emotion that you get from your customers that you're real people behind real social channels, it, it speaks wonders for your brand, but also gives you that leverage where during crisis there was around... At one incident, we, we reached out to about 85% of our followers. Um, that other 15% were built up of our advocates jumping on as well and helping out. So I think that just, you know, just paints a bit of a picture there as to kind of the advocacy that you can build up as a brand. Um, so that was a bit about Virgin Trains. I'm sure I'll, I'll, ask, I'll answer any questions um, either just after this or, or um, at lunch. But um, going through my journey then or my career, Fantastic 12 years at Virgin, um, uh, 
12, all 12 of those were at Virgin tra Trains, but I'd also worked alongside with Atlantic Media, Holidays <laughs> and so on. But um, for me, it was kind of what next in my career. Um, and Yopa Property Limited, I said a hybrid estate agent, were a new startup company um, that had no real focus on social customers. Um, they had uh, processes in place, but I think they needed a bit more of a steer as to what that looked like. So one of the things that um, you know, I thought was moving a touch away from social, um, but can fit within social teams, is web or live chat. And um, the reason I brought that in at, at Yopa was essentially to um, get people over the line. So when you're selling your property and you go on, a, go on the Yopa website at the time, it, it, there was a feeling or a sense that you're about to sell your property online, where actually all you're doing is booking a valuation so an agent can go into your house to value your property. Now, for you, that for somebody that hasn't sold or bought a property before, you know, um, using digital to book essentially a, a, um, an agent to come out and value your property isn't like your traditional high street where you'd go down to the shop or you'd phone them or whatever that looked like. So there was that nervousness. So bringing in live chat, we were able to remedy a lot of the questions at that point so that we could uh, essentially convert those customers to get ourselves in that house to, to value their property. So um, by bringing in live chat, we went from a 0.5% conversion rate to just over 10%. So that's, that's huge in terms of, number. I won't go into figures and, and financial value. You'll work that out yourselves if, you, if you're still looking at live chat. But um, those are huge numbers. Um, and so, you know, bringing in live chat and understanding the reason as to what you want live chat for, um, why you bring that in um, is, is, uh, is, is, is massive. So, you know, I'd always say um, to anyone looking at your live chat journey, it's understanding that end-to-end -end customer journey and process where live or web chat fits into that and what difference you can make, whether it be customer service, whether it's a boost conversion. Um, yeah, that's a bit about Yopa, really. Um, and last but not least, uh, I said my slides aren't very pretty. I apologise. So these are just all thrown together. Um, so as a consultant, um, priding myself uh, going into businesses, reshaping um, your strategy, um, looking at end-to-end -end processes, making full audits, recommendations. What Green King were really kind of struggling with was a bit of their content generation, and you know they've got <laughs> they've got assets coming out their ears, whether it be new products, menus, services. What they really struggled on was getting in the moment and getting Green King in, in a position where um, they could really shout about their, their restaurants, their pubs, um, and start to get people in there for the right reasons. Um, so again, this is just a slide, what I want to just go through shortly, uh, briefly around trending topics and putting your brand in that moment to start talking and giving your brand a reason to talk about that. So the top left hand corner um, is, did we win Star Baker? So it's Great British Bake Off, being in the moment. As Soon as that show kicks off, we jumped on it to promote our new pie and a cake. Pie and a cake, got that right. Um, so it's a, a pie within a chocolate fudge cake, which is really unusual anyway. It's at Hungry Horse Pubs. I don't work for them anymore, I'm not an advocate. Well, I am an advocate, but I don't, you know, I'm not selling this. But um, you know, I think it was just a good way to get ourselves in that moment to pr promote something new on our menu. Um, we had a new burger, that was just trending topic, was always going to be Halloween. We tried to think more social, and you've probably seen and opened them on the buzzes, trains, where you know, you're watching something and all of a sudden something comes out and scares you. Um, this was just uh, a post that got, um, it was about £4,000 of estimated media value. Um, these all went out organically, by the way. Um, but the reach and the engagement we got off this was absolutely fantastic. So all it was was two burgers side by side. Um, you had to spot the, bis the difference. Now, obviously, there's no difference. And the, the whole premise was that after about five seconds, you shit yourself and something jumps <laughs> on the screen. So it was very social. It was fun. It was shareable. You're showing your friends. You're showing your colleagues just to give them a bit of a Halloween boost and, and scare the shit out of them, basically. Um, again, uh, here, you've probably seen it, the, the whole debate over pineapple and pizza and should it be allowed on, on, on and... I'd say raise your hands, but I'm not a pineapple lover, so I'm not going to disagree or agree with any of you. But this was a very, um, you know, a meme video that, you know, it's, it's very current, it's very social, it's what's in the moment. It's tr trying to bring our customers to life, spark that engagement. But base, in short, the video, the guy pretends to put pineapple on the pizza and just chucks it because it's like, 
it's not acceptable. Uh, it's, not, it's not warranted. So, um, again, it just sparks that debate. And the one on the, the very end there, that's um, the recent spat between Colleen and Rebecca. Um, so, we, so that's more beef uh, than Colleen and Rebecca. And Wagatha Christie is the hashtag. So jumping on, jumping on a trending topic, again, being in that moment, using, we, we already had assets, we had the product available. You know, it's just regurgitating what content you've got, but just repurposing it correctly, I guess. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to wrap it up as quickly as possible because I know we've got other um, people on and we've got lunch to think about at the moment because my belly's rumbling, <laughs> especially with all the food that's uh, <laughs> being advertised on here. Um, so I think for me, I'm hoping that's given you a quick whistle-stop tour of a bit of a journey that I've been on. You know, we talk about being human. Uh, I, can't, I can't kind of drill that in enough. Um, getting the right teams, um, understanding your own processes, understanding where social and live chat fit within your business. Um, which uh, is a good segue into. Um, so I've been doing this for many years um, in terms of some of the talks and being a massive advocate of social signing and now all um, Not just being on registration, not just being a speaker, but I now actually work for Orlo. Um, have been for the last week and a half, so still trying to figure out whether... <laughs> Is it reception? You know, is it, is it, I, I tried my coats earlier, but I'd, I'd get that wrong. Um, but I think for me, w coming into Orlo is to share my experiences with <laughs> new and existing clients and try and help you on your journey. So whether you're thinking about, you know, taking on Orlo, you know, unfortunately you'll probably get a bit of me, you know, in there. But it's to make sure that customers are getting the best out of their platform, the best out of their strategy, their yeah, they're committed to the business and what they want to achieve via social, um, but also also holding their hand throughout the entirety of, you know, whether it be a contract or not, and, and looking at what services we can offer in, in that space, really. So, um, as I said, no work for Orlo, but um, have to take any questions at any point, um, or come and grab me for a coffee if you want to chat about anything I've just discussed. So thank you. Thank you.